Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Ramya. I'm the new uh, Community Engagement Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Um, this is our first uh, um, lecture for our fall series. Uh, we'll have another one each month. Um, today, we are going to have Dalton Hesley talk to you about uh, restoring coral reefs. And this lecture in particular is important today because, um, as some of you may know, we have a Reef Restoration Day coming this Saturday, um, which is also going to be working with Dalton and Rescue a Reef. And uh, we're hoping to make that an annual event where we get the community involved in restoring the reefs around Key Biscayne. And he can tell you more about what we're going to be doing. Awesome. Thank you, Romya. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Dalton Hesley. I am a research associate uh, in the Coral Reef Research Lab at the University of Miami Erasmus, just right across the bridge there on Virginia Key. Um, on top of that, I am program manager of Rescue a Reef. Rescue a Reef is simply the uh, citizen science project inside of our research lab. Um, so Dr. Diego Learman of the University of, Mi University of Miami heads our research lab and is the director of our Rescue Reef program. Um, but about a year and a half ago, he gave me um, the power to actually run it. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit more about that today. So. Rescue Reef. I'll briefly get into a little more in depth about what the program is specifically. Uh, as I mentioned, our research lab uh, is focused on coral restoration, which if you're not familiar with coral, restora coral restoration yet, you will be by the end of this lecture. Um, to put it into perspective, it's simply growing corals that are threatened to then replant onto uh, degraded reefs in hoping of assisting populations recovering. So Rescue Reef is special is that it opens the door to individuals like yourself to actually join our lab and assist us um, and, and work underwater as, our, as part of our team. So here you can see that in the morning, we kind of give a training session to all of our citizen scientists. Uh, we then load up the boat, everyone gets ready, you know, we're, we're full of divers and snorkelers. We then work in our coral nursery. So we have an underwater coral nursery where we house all of our corals. So here you can see one of our citizen scientists helping to clean uh, some of the overgrowth on those, those nursery trees. We then collect coral from that underwater nursery to transport to a local reef that is degraded, could use some extra coral uh, cover. And then we outplant it. So you can see there that is a successfully attached coral um, from our nursery. And then you can see one of our citizen scientists working in the background. So to take a step back, the basics. What are corals? Why are they important? Why do we talk about them so much? So here's a coral skeleton. Uh, corals are animals, but they lay down a skeleton like a rock. So some people confuse corals with rocks. Uh, but then they also house these symbiotic algae, little plants inside their tissue. Um, so it's a really complicated organism. A lot of people get confused what corals are and why they're so important. Um, but they're very, very specialized in that they're all mostly along the equator and they house thousands of species of different reef organisms that we rely on every day. So to get an even better understanding of corals, I like to use this analogy of a, sky, like a, a, a skyscraper. So you imagine Brickle um, and you have a tall sky riser and everyone that lives in each complex goes onto their balcony that's one animal. That's one individual coral polyp. And then the entire building is the colonial like organism. So on this one skeleton of coral, this houses hundreds of individual coral polyps. The polyp is the animal, but they work together as a, a communal organism. Um, they share signals, they talk to each other, they share nutrients. So if you look at it, you can see here's the high riser, and then here is actually um, a type of coral and every one of these little dots is one individual animal. So you can see that it kind of resembles a skyscraper. To zoom in even further, so this is a cross section of one individual polyp. So that's one animal, one coral polyp. And then we cut them in half so you can see that inside the tissue, so this thin white layer there, inside the tissue lives an algae or like a plant. So that plant works together with the animal to share nutrients. Um, the animal gets the nutrients from the plant, so the plant turns the sun's light into energy, and then the plant gets a home inside the animal, so they work together. We'll call them their roommates. So coral is an animal, they have these algae as roommates. So here are some of the common species you'll see in Miami, uh, in South Florida. 
You'll see these brain corals on top, called brain corals, kind of look like a brain. You'll get more of these mounding corals that just kind of form big humps. Then you'll get into the branching corals, which is what staghorn is, the coral I brought for you guys today, which is in the top right. Um, both the top right coral, the staghorn coral, and the top left coral, uh, which is called elk horn, are both threatened in this area. So that's why we focus a lot of our attention on those because they're, they might disappear soon and we're gonna try and make sure it doesn't happen. And then in the bottom you get finger corals. They kind of look like a finger. So there's a ton of different species, but today, like I said, I'll be talking about staghorn and I'll get into that a little more in depth uh, in a moment. So what are some reasons? Why do we even care about corals? I mean, they're pretty. We like to look at them. We know Nemo lives there, but there's a lot of other reasons. Storm protection. So coral reefs actually provide a natural barrier between our city and the ocean. So when those strong hurricanes come through, if there wasn't a coral reef there acting as a wall, we might see a lot more damage to all of our houses than we would if the coral reefs uh, weren't there. Building materials. So limestone, a lot of times the sidewalk or the building you're near is actually made of coral, fossilized coral. One way to check is if you look at it and you see zigzags, tons of squiggly zigzags, and it looks like a brain, that's probably a fossilized coral that was made thousands and thousands or millions of years ago. So we use this as building materials. Sand for beaches. If you went to South Beach or Crandon Beach, that sand that's there was likely made on a reef and is washed ashore now. So a lot of cool things. Um, obviously the main one is home to many reef organisms. So fish, crabs, lobsters, sharks, those call reefs home. If the corals weren't there, we don't know where they would go or if they'd be able to find a new home. Um, lastly, the one that's most important in this area is probably fisheries and tourism. So people like snorkeling, they like fishing, they like scuba diving, um, as well as many other things. So it drives a lot of people to come and check out Miami. It's a popular hotspot because we have these beautiful reefs. And if you add all this up, this number I think is actually a little low, but annually, worldwide, they provide over $375 billion a year in services through the things I've listed through many others like education, medicine, you name it, coral reefs probably do it. That's a lot of good things, but there are some bad things too. Coral reefs are disappearing. 75% of the world's reefs are highly threatened um, due to a number of different issues. And a third of all coral species are at risk of extinction, including staghorn, which is right in our backyard. Why? Why are, these happen Why are we seeing these, uh, these decreases? Well, it's a combination of human-induced stressors as well as natural stressors. So I'll get a little more in depth between human and natural stressors. So some of the big ones is climate change. You guys have heard climate change quite a bit. Um, because the earth is warming and the ocean is warming, that's actually causing the corals to be really stressed out. Uh, the way I like to describe, describe corals are divas. They like a certain depth, a certain temperature, a certain amount of nutrients, and if those things change, they get cranky real quick. So when the oceans heat up, they actually kick out their roommate. Remember the uh, symbiotic algae, the little plant that lives in their tissue? So when corals get stressed out, they kick them out. They say, you gotta go, we like you, but it's too much. And that actually causes the coral to be really stressed out because they actually they kind of counted on that algae to provide all of their nutrients and their energy. So then they're stressed, they're not getting as much energy as they need, and sometimes that results in death. Um, acidification. So because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere from climate change, that actually ends up in the ocean, which in turn makes the ocean more acidic. Like Coca-Cola, when you drink Coca-Cola, it kind of burns your throat. That's literally what's happening to the ocean, slowly but surely. And that causes the skeleton that corals live on to dissolve. So they're trying to build up, and they're actually crumbling below themselves. Uh, and then sea level change. You see that a ton here in Miami that we're getting these, um, these storms that are causing a lot more of the streets to flood. And it's, it's really gradual, but it is an issue. On top of that, there's overfishing. People are just simply taking too many fish out and they're not able to kind of reproduce quick enough. And that's tipping the scales in an in a unfavorable direction. Uh, disease, it's kind of unknown, but um, there are a lot of diseases that come through and affect corals. We are looking into it to try and figure out why and where they're coming from. And then coastal development. Simply taking out seagrass beds and mangrove forests uh, actually has a really big impact on coral reefs because a lot of these juvenile baby fish live in the seagrass beds and the mangroves and then make their way out to the corals. But if we take away their, their little nurseries, then they have nowhere to grow up. Like I said, coral bleaching, here's a good image of it. So many people see a coral like this and they assume it's either dead or bleached, but it could be one or the other. 
Um, you'll see right here is an image of a healthy coral. It's kind of brown or orange. That's what staghorn coral actually looks like when it's alive. It's a, a brownish, orangish hue. And then on the left, that's a bleached coral. So it's not necessarily dead. Um, those roommates I was talking about, the symbiotic algae and their tissue, give them their beautiful colors. So when they kick out the roommate, they lose the color. So they still have tissue and the animal's still alive, it's just transparent, so you can see the skeleton. But this one is dead, so this one has no polyps, it can't come back to life, um, but when a coral bleaches, it can recover. So you can see it's the same thing down there. Bleaching events are happening much more, more frequently. We've actually had two consecutive years here in uh, South Florida. This year is also supposed to be another bleaching event. It happens usually in September, October, when, when it's been warming all, all summer. Um, and we do a lot of monitoring for that, so we'll see. There's our area. That's a lot of dots right there. Acidification, like I said, remember it's just dissolving uh, the corals underneath themselves. Overfishing, um, that, the best example is parrotfish. So parrotfish do a really good job of grazing on top of reefs and, and eating the algae because algae grows fast, much faster than coral. But if you take out too many of the parrotfish, they're not grazing as heavily and this algae is able to really blossom, really bloom all over the reef and it's going to outcompete corals. So something as simple as that, just too many parrotfish out of the reef, you could tip the ecosystem in the wrong direction um, and end up with a, a negative impact on corals overall. The reason many of these species are listed as threatened initially is because of diseases. So staghorn coral up until around the late 1970s, early 1980s was actually the main reef building coral of South Florida, but white plague disease came through and diminished populations to about 5% of what they were. So almost nothing. And then coastal development. I already mentioned uh, the different impacts you can see from coastal development, simply taking a, a natural uh, shoreline habitat and, and replacing it with a seawall can actually have pretty big impacts uh, long term. So there are a few different things that are kind of going to determine the future of reefs. Uh, the big picture, that's societal actions, what we do as a whole um, to try and change our influence on corals. The atmosphere ocean response, so just nature, how is nature going to respond, that's still kind of to, to be determined. And then the organismal response, that's the actual coral. So we don't know how corals are going to adapt, if they're going to be able to kind of create more resilience, get tougher. Um, we're looking into that as well. A lot of different experiments at the University of Miami is looking into this. With all that being said, what can we do? All right, I mean, all of us are just individuals. It's hard to think, you know, I can have an impact on coral reefs, but every one of us can. So here are some things that divers specifically can do um, or non-divers. You can shop for sustainable seafood. You probably hear this all the time. Um, there's many different or organizations that just tell you what seafood's good to buy and which one's not. Um, as simple as that. Uh, it's really easy and it takes about two seconds, but um, places like Whole Foods and now Publix actually do a really good job of already looking at that for you, so it makes it easier. Take only photographs, leave only bubbles, that's just, you don't collect corals, don't touch them. Um, a lot of people already tell you those things. Give reefs a checkup, so there's organizations that actually let you do like a reef check, where when you're diving you can enter up a, a data log, of just what you thought the reef looked like, how it's doing, um, as well as a few other options there. There's a lot of things online if you wanted to look. So what are we doing? I mentioned that we're a coral restoration research lab, but what is that specifically? So, coral gardening. Had anyone heard of coral gardening before today? A few hands, nice, that's great. So coral gardening is a lot like it sounds like. You're growing corals, much like in a garden, to then put or plant back onto the reef. Um, it's really, really simple too. It's four easy steps. The first being collect small pieces from the wild. So around nine years ago, when Dr. Learman founded the Coral Restoration Lab at the U, they collected 30 initial fragments of about a finger size. So literally my pointer finger, 30 pieces that large of different genotypes, all from staghorn corals. Once that's done, you just simply move them to a nursery. So you find a location that's suitable. It's, it's got a, the right amount of light, the right amount of nutrient flow, the right depth, things like that. And you put them there, you let them grow. So they'll get bigger. You can see here on the top image, that's around the size of initial corals. And then about a year later, those same corals will look like the below image. So once they're large, you then trim them. Um, it's called pruning. A lot of people are familiar with in a rose garden. I, I'm, not, I'm not a gardener, but in a rose garden, you prune your rose garden and it actually increases growth. It's the same with these corals. When you fragment 
uh, branches off of this coral colony, it increases its growth. It will grow more branches in place of it at a faster pace. So you can imagine that with small initial amounts of coral, we let them grow, we cut off the branches, they grow faster, we cut off the branches, they grow faster, and while we're doing this, we're moving more corals to different areas, we get a lot of coral very quickly. So the last part is once we have all these corals at our disposal, we just move them back to the reef. So the impressive part is that I told you initially um, our lab collected 30 fragments of about a finger length size. We now have three coral nurseries for a total of over 3,500 staghorn coral colonies, all basketball size or larger. That's a lot of coral. We have not collected from the wild since. We've outplanted over 7,600 corals to date, um, all from those initial 30 fragments. So that's quite a lot. You can tell that it's got an ecologically significant level at this point. And that's why we're at the point where we want to encourage individuals to join us because there's not enough of us to do it every day, all day. So we want to get the individuals like you involved so that you can help and you can learn about corals in the process. Um, here you can see, this is supposed to look like um, the initial coral that you're collecting from. So you can see it collect fragments just like that. We use snips like so, just wire cutters. Uh, and you fragment off a branch, it's actually really simple. You then move those into the nursery. You let the nursery grow, grow some more. And then when you collect them, you attach them onto the reef, like so. Once attached, you can see they're, they're very simple, just fingerling size coral fragments. And now that was initially a boat scar. So a, a boat ran aground there. Um, and our lab used our coral to then kind of reconstruct that area of the reef. Again, so there's initial, that's after eight months. So then we fragmented off the top of the colony and moved those to a different location. And then again, after eight months. So it's very quick. That's one of the quickest coral species you'll see. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier why we use Acropora cervicornis. So that's the, the Latin name, but you guys can call it staghorn coral. Mostly for two reasons. One, I'd said that it's the main reef building structure of South Florida. So it's important. It creates the reef. It's very intricate. A lot of branches. Fish love just hiding in there. Crabs, a lot of things. It's, it's home. The second is because it grows fast and it likes being cut. So the fact that it grows fast means we don't have to wait a year to see any result. We can wait four or eight months. And then its natural life history is fragmenting. So if you picture a natural giant branching colony on the reef and a large wave comes through and it breaks off a branch. So like this, and it fragments off, this branch will roll to a new location on the reef, kind of wedge itself, and then begin to grow in that area. Kind of like planting a seed, a tree that plants a seed, a coral colony will just break off a branch and grow a new one. And that will start and blossom and bloom in that area or grow in that area. And it'll happen over and over. And that's why we're seeing those increases in growth when we fragment is because it's their natural life history. So that works really, really well for our process because it's just simulating their natural life history. Um, here are some examples. We actually use the one in the top right. Um, but those are many different structures that you can use to grow corals. It's pretty much whatever's at your disposal. It's very cheap. Um, that's one of the reasons it works so well as well because it's just PVC pipe or rope. Uh, buoys can be replaced by two liter bottles. Um, this is a downscale model of our coral trees, which we house all of our corals in. So we have a spot actually about two miles off of Key Biscayne here where we have 12 of these trees. The actual ones are much larger. They're about five feet tall with five foot long arms. Each arm can house 12 corals uh, with 10 arms, so every tree has 120 corals on it. Um, and they just hang. We kind of call them Christmas trees because we anchor them into the sand and then put a buoy at, on top and then they can just kind of free float. And the corals love it. It's like a nursery that they hang and they, they grow and they're really in the right location for that. What are the goals? What do we hope to accomplish from coral restoration? One, minimize the negative impact on wild populations. If we just collect coral to move to a different location over and over, it didn't, wouldn't make any sense. We're not actually creating new reef, but the way we do it, we are. Um, maximize productivity in the nursery. That just means grow a ton of coral in our nursery, which we are extremely good at now. Lastly, produce a sustainable source of genotypes. So different individuals, much like we're all the same species or we're all humans, we're all individual people, right? 
So we would like to have that for corals as well because this coral is a different one than this coral. So we want to make sure we keep as many different ones as we can to make sure populations that we're putting onto reefs are diverse too. Rather than having a hundred of me on the reef, it'd be much better to have a hundred of us on the reef. So here's kind of a map of our work to date. This is actually a little old, so it might be a little more extensive. Um, but you can see we've outplanted this. Yeah, actually now I can see it's not, um, it's not as in depth. So Key Biscayne is right here. We're sitting right there. And you can see we've outplanted all the way down to pretty much Key Largo. So it's, it's been very extensive. We've actually started working much more north. So we're all the way past uh, North Miami Beach as well. And like I said, it, it, on this figure, it says 7,600 corals. I would say we're closer to 9,000 now um, to date. So a good estimation for you guys to picture is this little guy out planted under the reef after just one year will be roughly the size of a basketball. So they get large quick. So you can imagine that just using ones this size, we've out planted ones much larger. That's 9,000 basketballs back under the reef. That's a lot of reef structure um, all along the Florida Reef Tract. So I've been mentioning Rescue Reef quite a bit. Um, we are actually partnered with the Shark Research and Conservation Program, which many of you probably heard is the shark tagging organization at UM Rasmus. A lot of the school groups around here go out tagging sharks. Um, we're mirrored after them. So we saw their work. We saw how great it was to connect with the community. We want to do the same because we felt it was important research that we were conducting, but for us to conduct research and publish it isn't the same as having people join us and, and talking to them face to face. So that's why Rescue Reef was created. Uh, it's a way to just better engage all of you through social media, through public presentations, and through research on the boat right alongside us. Um, if an individual is to come out with us on Rescue Reef trips, uh, there's two parts. It's a two dive trip. Um, like I said, the first is all of our scientists actually kind of training you guys in the morning before the dive, letting you know pretty much everything I've told you today, um, as well as showing you the tools you use, the best practices, things like that. Um, and then we head to our, our coral nursery. So like I said, it's just right off the, the shoreline here, um, about a 20 minute uh, boat ride. And then we have all of our citizen scientists. So everyone that dives or snorkels with us is a citizen scientist volunteering for the U. Uh, they'll help at our nursery to kind of clean the trees. They get a lot of overgrowth and, and organisms like crustaceans and stuff. Um, they'll have to take measurements and then they'll actually collect coral for us. So on the left, you can see a brand new tree with brand new coral. And on the right, that was eight months later. So they grow quick. That's why we need to go in and, and upkeep as much as possible. They will also help collect and then transport. So you can see there, we collect quite a bit of coral for our outplanting sessions. Um, and the second part is actually putting the coral back onto the reef. So to demonstrate that, I brought our little reef model here. This is just cement that we use to kind of mimic a reef, a reef you know, made of limestone. Um, there's a few steps. What we tell everyone to do when they're out planting corals for us is to picture planting a tree. The first thing you do when you're going to plant a tree, you're going to look for a good spot on the ground, nice soil. You're going to look to make sure there's like a little open area for it to grow. It's the same thing with a coral. You're going to find a nice spot on the reef where there, there's no other corals, no sponges, no critters live in there. And then you're going to kind of clean the area. So there's going to be some algae and sand on the, on the reef. You just brush that away. Um, and then you'll take a hammer and nail and drive the nail right into the reef. Uh, you'll make sure it's nice and sturdy. And then the coral that we collected from the first dive, you just zip tie it right to the nail. Um, as simple as that. So if this was one we had collected in the nursery, we just put it flush against the nail and zip tie it. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen a zip tie, there's just these fancy little things us scientists love that when you pull it one way, it doesn't go back. And so you pull it as tight as you can, and then it creates like a bind. It connects it to the, to the nail. Um, the next question you all are thinking is what happens to the nail and the zip tie? After about two to three weeks, the coral will actually begin to lay tissue down over top the nail and the zip tie. So that's how corals grow. They, they lay down tissue and they grow and they build a skeleton. So after two to three weeks, you'll start to see that. After two to three months, the coral will actually lay the skeleton down over the nail and the zip tie and begin to attach itself to the reef. Um, to the point where it'll actually be hard to find the nail in the zip tie because there will be skeleton over top of it. After about one year, like I said, these corals this size will actually be roughly the size of a basketball 
and the nail and zip tie will have been completely enveloped by a skeleton. So it'll be inside the coral as it grew over top of it. It's really, really a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I hope I have, I have a few good images. So as you can see here, these are just individuals around Miami that wanted to come out with us. You can see they're working. She's nailing in right there with a the coral waiting. They're working together, sharing their equipment. Um, and then the individual up there is also out planning. So the results are a thing of beauty. Um, this is what it looks like. You'll see there's like a little wad of white at the base of the coral. That's uh, underwater epoxy. It's like a cement, like super glue, kind of putty. Uh, we add that sometimes just as an extra measure because when a coral's put in a new location, it's panicking. It's freaking out like, whoa, what just happened to me? Why am I somewhere else? Um, it will, as quickly as possible, try and attach to the reef because that's its home. It doesn't like moving around like a fish. It, it likes to stand in one place, like a tree. So by zip tying it to the nail and adding the epoxy, we're hoping to kind of simulate being cemented to the reef so it can just focus on growth and reproduction. So that's why we add that. Um, and then here on the left, you'll see just, this is tiny. This is zoomed way in. That is just a coral about this size that was out planted three years ago. And this is how large that is now. That's massive. It's roughly this size. Um, so that's kind of what I was trying to get at is that we have corals that are five years old now. Um, so those are much larger than a basketball. After about a year to two years, these corals that we've outplanted will begin to fragment themselves naturally, and they'll have repopulated that area by themselves without lifting a finger, which is the beauty of coral restoration is that after we're gone, it continues to build upon itself. That's pretty much it. Um, that's how coral restoration works. That's how Rescue Reef was designed to hopefully get people out with us. Um, as Romy mentioned, the special thing about this is we actually connected with the Key Biscayne Community Foundation for a pretty big coral restoration day, reef restoration day on Saturday. So we, they provided a donation to actually sponsor a rescue trip, trip. So it was free to all the divers who wanted to come out and join us. And then we invited friends, family, neighbors, anyone that's interested to come join us after the dive. Um, so Saturday around 1.30 to have a barbecue, to learn more about corals, to talk to our other scientists and things like that. So this was a really special opportunity. I can't thank them enough for inviting us. Um, with that, does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. Yeah. the climate change and the acidity in the water, mm -hmm. that it's destroying the reef and, and they're crumbling. How long do these reef planted um, corals have start to get that effect? Of so that's, that's a great question. The research that showed that they're actually kind of crumbling beneath themselves was for North Miami Beach and a little further up um, toward Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and that's in the winter. So ocean acidification is having a bigger impact in that it's just not allowing reefs to grow as fast as they normally would. So in some areas, yes, they're actually kind of crumbling beneath themselves, but in this area, they're just not growing as fast as they should be. Um, so staghorn coral, that's a great question because a lot of people ask why are we putting corals out right now when there's so many issues surrounding coral reefs. Staghorn coral populations were decimated by that disease in the 1970s, early 1980s and have since persisted. They haven't really declined or increased. They've kind of just maintained exactly where they are. So coral restoration is our way of kind of pushing them back, where by adding these corals, we're increasing populations. And our idea is there's a lot of wild populations dispersed pretty, pretty far away along the reef track. And so when they're sexually reproducing, not when they're fragmenting, that's asexual, when they're sexually reproducing to make new ones, they're too far and it, ca it can't happen. So we're trying to create a constellation of restoration sites to kind of connect the dots, to fill in the gaps. Um, so with our help, our idea is it, they'll be able to recover on their own and we'll be out of jobs, but we'll be okay with that. Reef itself, a community, to attract the fishes and the creatures and critters. Um, the simplest answer, it's instant. Usually when we outplan our large coral colony, so a, a small individual like this will take a little bit to contribute, um, probably about a year before they'll be large enough to be called home. But our lab and our researchers outplant corals that are huge already, massive. So from right away, it's a lot of intricate structure, and usually you'll see a lot of bluehead rats, and they're they're kind of they, uh, they have a they kind of live in packs of like twenty, and they'll actually just kind of inhabit it right away. Um, and we've had experiments where we'll outplant corals, uh, the staghorn corals, into a thicket. So that's the natural way that they grow is in these dense combined populations. That's like a, a rainforest of, of trees. 
And we've simulated that where we all plant them extremely close together. And, and we've seen that after just a couple months, it's dense enough um, from growth that you see a lot of marine life there. So that's why this is such a great short term solution is because it's creating reef that's being degraded um, so that populations can try and recover with our, uh, our, our assistance. So that, that, that's, it's the tricky thing about it is we don't know why they get sick. So because we don't know why they get sick, we don't know how to get them better yet. Um, a lot of times corals can fight it off. Usually what we found is when corals are stressed out, I remember I said they're divas. So if it's too hot and they get a little cranky, they're actually more likely to get sick then. Um, so that's what we're seeing is in hot months like this, like uh, September, October, we see more disease because it's a lot hotter. So we're, we're really trying hard to figure it out. Good question. Yeah. Uh, and so we try and simulate the uh, depth of the reef. And we actually found a really beautiful spot where it's kind of surrounded by a horseshoe of reef. And we went to the sand patch. So we anchored them down and we buoy them up to about the exact level they'd be growing on the reef. Um, and we made sure there's good water flow and they're at the right depth so that they get enough light, you know, because they, they get most of their energy from the sun. Um, so they're sitting at about 25 feet. We'll outplant anywhere from 12 to 30, though, because, yeah, they, they like all different um, depths. It's just a lot of times based on what kind of flow. So the shallower sites will get a lot more water flow, so it's cooler. Um, the uh, deeper sites where are just, they're just naturally... Um, able to kind of inhabit that area. Yeah. Um, does it hurt when you zip tie them? Like, does the coral? You want the truth? So, a few of the polyps on the branch. So, remember, I said every one of these bumps is an animal. A few of them get crushed, but that's good. Remember that when they fragment, they actually say, okay, we got to start growing. So, tons of new corals will actually grow over top where the old ones are, um, but they, they do take one for the team. Yeah. Have they ever like, broken when you're trying to put in the sand? They do. So we've had some that, uh, this one's probably okay, but some that are a little skinnier, more frail. If you pull too hard, they could kind of break in that spot, but we've just learned to let them grow a little longer. So now most of the ones we put out there are nice and thick. They, they're like a, a penny thick at least. Um, and then when we zip tie them, they're nice and sturdy. They got a good skeleton foundation. So Rescue Reef specifically is unique because it's the only restoration project through a university. So a lot of our research is science-based and, and we publish our results. But coral restoration is practiced really widely, which is fantastic, all the way from Fort Lauderdale to um, uh, the Tortugas, all through the Caribbean, as well as many other areas as, as well. So there's multiple different agencies that are all kind of helping each other figure out the best way to go about it. Um, uh, uh, Nova up in Fort Lauderdale is doing coral restoration. Moat Marine Lab is uh, doing coral restoration. The Coral Restoration Foundation is, um, as well as many others. So it, it's a lot of collaboration, but um, Rescue Reef is specific to Miami. Is it happening to go underwater? So in areas that need it. Um, branching corals do work the best. So if there's an area that has branching corals that are threatened, it's likely it is occurring because it just it's so simple, it's so cheap, and the results are so dramatic. Um, I would say yes. In the Pacific, the Atlantic, you're going to see a lot of coral restoration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have no idea, but I do not want to find out. Like I was saying, I mean, so many different reef uh, organisms call it home, so we really don't know where they would go. Um, we don't know if corals would end up moving shallower, if they go deeper. Um, there's so much up in the air, we have no idea. So I would prefer if it just stays the same. So I'm going to work to make sure it's the exact same as it is right now. It's a good question. Yeah, no. Um, since you guys work at a university, do you like this? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. So we are actually partnered with the UM Scuba Club. So a lot of undergraduates get to dive with us. And then the research diving class at the graduate school, um, they come out with us too. So students come with us all the time. They're some of our favorite divers. So our lab is currently kind of branching out, no pun intended. Um, we're working with Elkhorn, that other uh, platy coral that I showed you, and then mounding corals. So these, these ones are obviously called branching, like I said, because they have a lot of branches, but mounding corals are simply just the big boulders you'll see a lot but they grow really slow. So this one will grow 10 to 15 centimeters per year on every branch. <coughs> Mounting corals grow about one centimeter per year. So just a fraction, just tiny amounts. Um, but we learned, thanks to Moat, that if you take a mounding coral 
and you cut it into a ton of tiny little pieces, just really itsy bitsy ones, that actually ramps up their growth a ton. Um, so the idea is if you cut them into a bunch of tiny pieces, let them grow really fast and then fuse them back together, all you have to do is put them next to each other, they'll grow back together. Um, you can double your size in the fraction of the time. So our lab is actually beginning to uh, look into that research as well, where we have mountain corals in our nurseries right now. Yeah? How long has this been, how long has this been happening? Rescue Reef? Yeah. About a year and three months. So we're still pretty young. Uh, this summer was our, our second summer, and so it was really great because we had people that dove with us last summer and outplanted corals come out with us again this summer so they could actually see their corals a year later. And it was really special. They were happy as, as heck to see them grow so much. So we, we monitor closely. We're able to visit our nursery once um, a week, likely. Um, we don't see it a lot in the nursery, just because, weirdly enough, they do so well in the nursery. They grow faster, they're healthier. Um, we think it's just because they're more renewed, removed from other species that they don't get, they don't, we don't see disease very often, but if we do, we quarantine it immediately. So we, we'll cut off those colonies, we'll move them to a different location, um, away from anything else really. Um, and then for outplanting, after one month, we actually consider the coral attached, as long as it's began to envelop the nail. And then after one year, actually it's about six months after we outplant, it's a wild population at that point, because anything we see is not our doing. Uh, you know, we successfully outplanted it. It's begun to grow and become a natural part of the reef. And after six months, we say it is a natural part of the reef. So if you see disease or anything like that, um, it's really not in our control. It wasn't anything they got from us. Um, but we do monitor it. If we if we saw any pattern where specific corals that we were outplanting were getting disease, we definitely look into it. But to date, it hasn't it hasn't seen that. Um, I, was that was there a part of missing? Well, no. So No, no, no. The, the same diseases that we're seeing, um, always around the same part of the year, right about now, and, and it's likely because they're stressed out already because of the temperatures, so they're just more susceptible. Um, it's When you get sick with one thing, you're more susceptible to something else, and it's the same with corals. So we, we monitor it, but at this point, there's nothing we can do. Um, especially with wild colonies, we're not allowed to, you know, uh, quarantine those so that they have to just run their course. Yeah, in the back. Certainly. Um, I didn't think that was the case because it's always nice here to me, but it is windier in the winter. And so from about November, November December to March, it's, it's tricky. Um, but if we can go out, we certainly do because the waters are just naturally cooler. So the corals are going to have a better shot of surviving. Um, but it, it has to be flat enough. I mean, we won't go out there if it's dangerous. Um, and then, so that's why we're, we're busiest in the summer. I mean, we're doing expeditions every other weekend and our lab's going out once or twice a week, but um, certainly slows down the winter. Yes? We have um, flagged the website and also Facebook. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're actually on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. It's just another way to try and connect with people that can't come out with us for some reason or another. Um, then they can see how our outplants are doing, videos from recent expeditions, new research, things like that. They're all really a fun follow. Um, and I, I thank you for that. And then, yes, our website's in the bottom right corner. Um, it's nothing flashy, but it, it gets the job done. Yeah. What happens if you don't have the nursery? We don't. We never do. So it's, it's the crazy thing is, you can actually kind of see it here. So imagine this being a coral this size. They're, they are roughly the same. It's just zoomed in. So you can see that this coral, this is probably about four or five months later, it's grown new branches, so you can see it's got new polyps, new individual branches all over the place. And it's hard to see for you guys, but this zip tie here, does it look yellow to you guys? It used to be red. So the, the coral actually put its own tissue, which looks kind of yellow, over top the red zip tie. So what happens is it'll put the tissue over top those things, right? And then corals actually put skeleton down underneath themselves. So you know when we grow, we get our bones get bigger? their bones get bigger too, their skeletons get bigger. So it actually grows over top the nail and the zip tie. So eventually you're gonna have a coral that's this thick and then somewhere in the middle is where the nail used to be, but it just grows over top of it. Mm -hmm. What happens if uh, I don't die and I don't go there? So we do take snorkelers as well. Um, we found a way to get snorkelers involved if, the, if they're willing to come out and help us. Um, it's just a different design where it's a coral cookie. 
And so they'll actually, it's, it looks like a chocolate chip cookie. It's got three indentations and it's flat like a cookie. And you cement the corals on the boat to that cookie. And then you put that epoxy, that underwater cement on the bottom, hold your breath, and you push it on the reef. Um, they actually grow really well that way. Um, in case you aren't able to do either or not interested in doing snorkeling or diving, some of the things we say is to try and reduce your coral footprint. So I've, I'm sure you've heard of reducing your carbon footprint, just the amount of CO2 you inadvertently put into the atmosphere. Some of the ways we say that you can, so if you try and do that, you're trying to help corals the same way. Um, no matter how far away from the coast you are, Iowa, Montana, Minnesota, you can have a positive impact on corals by simply reducing your carbon footprint. So buying food locally. If you go to a farmer's market, that food didn't have to get shipped from California, it came from Florida's backyard. So that saves all the energy and uh, fuel it took to ship it from across the coast. Um, what are some of the other ones? Carpooling, riding a bike, um, things like that. There was um, Meatless Monday. So if something like myself, I'm not a vegetarian, I, I like meat, but every Monday I skip meat that entire day uh, and that reduces my carbon emission because in order to grow cattle, like a cow, it takes way more water and food and energy than it does to grow uh, vegetables. So for one day, every single week, I just skip, skip meat. It's a great way to help corals. Reusable water bottles. Um, I have mine right here. So instead of using plastic, um, it just saves from uh, ending up in the ocean, plus the energy to make it. It saves you money. Um, there was another one too. But it, I believe it's on our website. So we actually try and come up with a huge list of things for people that can actually help our team in the field because um, some people want to help, but they don't know how. So that, that, would, that was a great question. I'm glad you asked it. And then you had a second one, yeah. Uh, not from the government. We have received grants. So in our first year, it was a lot about just networking, trying to meet people, get them excited about Rescue Reef and, and get divers with us. And a lot of it was just our director, Dr. Learman, kind of funding the project on his own to hopefully get you know, the ball rolling. Um, the TD Charitable Foundation has given us $5,000 in back-to-back -back years, which has been huge in our growth and development. And then we recently received the Moat Protect Our Reefs grant. If you guys have seen those license plates that have a coral reef on the back, um, the money from those license plates actually go to scientific researchers looking at ways to conserve corals and we applied for that grant, which is very competitive, and we were rewarded for it because they can see all the potential in our project. So we've got some, some grants that we've won uh, as of late that's really going to help us moving forward. But mostly we're just funded on donations and then, um, yeah, T-shirt sales, I guess. Because all of our expeditions, we charge $75 per diver, but that's actually not us charging. It's Divers Paradise that takes us out on the boat. And that covers the two tanks, mask and snorkel for their dive, and we don't ask for a dollar. So if people want to donate to us, they, they're more than likely, or they're more than, uh, uh, welcome. more than welcome to. Um, but otherwise, we mostly rely on our grants to help supplement our, our efforts. Yeah. So yeah, if you go to our website, just rescuereef.com, all of our information is on there, and then in the middle of the page is how you donate if you wanted to. And then Rumya could actually help with um, coming out to dive with us on Saturday or just to participate in the, the barbecue um, afterwards. So the Key Biscayne Community Foundation on their website, as well as the Key Biscayne uh, Citizen Science Project, both websites, I believe, have the links, right? Uh, I, I think so. The, the, key, the Citizen Science website definitely does. Yeah. Yep. And I can write that down for you. So the event is called Reef Restoration Day. Um, if you Googled that, it would likely pop up with the event right away. What was your question? Can you repeat your question? Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll write it down for you. Um, but we have been, we've all planned to as shallow as 12 and as deep as 30. Um, it really, what we look for, I, I didn't mention this, but what we look for is either there's wild coral present, so we know that the coral is supposed to be there, or we look at the, his, uh, the historical records and we see that staghorn coral used to be there. Um, and then we'll outplant corals, we'll monitor if they're successful, then we designate that a uh, potential restoration site and we increase our efforts afterwards. 18 feet, so pretty shallow. Um, it's actually a very special event because this is the first time we've ever had a trip sponsored by an organization. 
And so we put additional efforts into looking for a new reef, which is the one we're going to be using. And I believe there will be a, a, a naming afterwards. Uh, so whatever the community foundation decides to name that reef, that will be then called by us forever as that reef as an additional thank you for their, their generosity. Yeah. And it's really hard to get yourself, you know, mm -hmm. equal, you know find the equilibrium yeah. at that point. So are you not finding that the reefs are getting broken with the divers and the fins? I mean, we, is it counterproductive? That's so? part of our training session. We definitely don't want to cause more damage than the good we're doing. So the great part about our first dive at the nursery is it's all in sand. So the bottom, you, you can't harm the bottom at all. And we tell people, use this as practice to kind of dial in your buoyancy. Um, because as a, a research diver, we're able to stay perpendicular and hover in one spot and focus on outplaying corals without really thinking about it. But for divers that aren't experienced in that, it's certainly a, a new thing for them. And so that's why our nursery is great practice and we kind of encourage people to try it. And then add, we'll have four researchers out Saturday from our lab and they'll certainly be going around to make sure people are not only doing a good job out playing the corals but to make sure that their feet are up off the the reef because we don't we don't want to be kicking out plants we just put down um, but we haven't had many issues with that people are pretty good and, and they're working hard and they want to do a good job so they're they're pretty uh conscious of their their movements yeah How long do you, have to be to go diving? you have to be 18 um and that's not my rule that's the university's rule I would say 16, but as of right now, University of Miami says 18. Um, so we have a lot of high schoolers that are able to go nowadays, but we're hoping to get the doors open to a uh, younger participants soon. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you, guys.